appreciate so much the grace playing for our, our service and and that was Lily did such a wonderful job with the uh, specials when I was growing up my dad played the guitar some of you remember so we had music in our house uh, most of the time it was pretty good except when dad tried to teach us how to play <laughs> but uh, I could as far back as I could remember as a child my mom and dad sang in church and so those are good memories and uh, some great memories Fairness to blessedness permit me to preface our reading in the first chapter of the book of Ruth we're told of a famine in an arid land parts of the country would get 110 degrees in the shade and uh, trying to and, and mainly famine was caused because of the lack of rain not that they got a lot as it is so with a famine came the danger of starving the danger of losing your animals because it's better to uh, instead of them dying in the field either to sell them or to eat them so it was, it was bad. It was very bad. And sometimes this would last for quite some time. And we're told of the decision of Elimelech in verse 2 that they would go to Moab. Now this uh, picture here, uh, map, you can see they lived in Bethlehem. It says Bethlehem, Judah. And they came around and come down to Moab. As you remember, Moab, the descendants of Lot and his daughters, Moab and Edom. But so they came over and we're told uh, it's recorded that they lived there about 10 years in verse number 4. During that time, Naomi would lose her husband, her two sons, and uh, you've heard me say before that back in those days there were no social programs among the Gentiles for widows and orphans. Now God provided for His children and we'll talk about that provision directly. But uh, after a while Naomi decided to go home. Now remember, there's a verse in the scripture that says, uh, do not remove the ancient landmarks which I have set. At the corner of each property was placed a stack of stones. That stone would bear the name of the owner. That owner could not, under any circumstances, sell that property. Now if he got in debt and had to work off a debt, the debt, the, debt to, the person to whom he owed the debt could use his land and his family as servants up to seven years. Okay? Every seven years was a day was a, a time of rest. But then, on the 50th year, was the time of Jubilee. That's when all debts were canceled. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a great idea? All debts were canceled. Everybody could return home. They could not sell the land. So when Naomi decided to go home, she knew she had a home to go to. Okay? You remember uh, Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. And Naboth said, I can't sell it. I, I can't sell it to you. It, it's my family's. It's my family's perpetually. And after he went, went, uh, went away and pouted a little bit, his wife came and said, you're the king, just take it. Okay? Well, we know how that ended up, don't we? Okay? So she decided to go home. 
And in verse number 19, so they too went uh, until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem, all in the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? You remember she had her sons also passed away. And she had two daughters-in-law, which she entreated them to go home, go back to your families. But one of them, uh, uh, one of them by the name of Ruth, decided to stay with her. And uh, that famous verse there in chapter 1, isn't it? Where you dwell, I will dwell, and your God shall be my God, and so forth. Now, notice, starting in verse 20, And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, for the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against uh, me and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. The barley harvest, by the way, was around the middle of April. So that map shows us that they left Bethlehem, went around, came to Moab, stayed there ten years. There she would lose her husband, her two sons, and one daughter-in-law went home while Ruth remained with her, and they came back to Bethlehem. Now, the cities of Bethlehem and uh, many of the cities in the land of Israel were not populations of thousands and thousands. They were mainly families and extended families that lived in these um, in, the, in the towns. Okay? So now she's home. Don't call me Naomi. Okay? Now the meaning of the name of Naomi means pleasant one. Pleasant one. And Mara means bitter or bitterness. So she said, don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara. Because of all that's happened to me has turned me bitter. The name of Ruth means friend. Now her sons, Malion, his name meant man of sickness, man of entreating. So they were not in good health when they went. Chilion means pining or wasting away. So it was not a good deal. Okay? But they went and they lived there and of course they would perish there. So let's talk about God's provision for the children of Israel. This is an amazing thing. I already mentioned that the land owned by the family could not be sold under any circumstances. So Naomi knew that she had a house to go back to. May not look very good, may need a lot of, of fixing up, the true fixer-upper, but she had the property. It was hers. Okay? And God's provision for a, a kinsman redeemer, the nearest kin. Now here's, here's what would happen. If a young lady if a young lady's husband passed away, then the nearest kin would take her to wife so that she would bear children in her first husband's name. So that line would never end. That was the purpose of it. Sounds strange in our society today, doesn't it? But that's how they did it. But God's provision. Secondly, the provision for the poor, they were instructed not to harvest the corners of the field. They were to leave the corners. If a handful of grain fell on the ground, they were to leave it. And then when the poor would come, they would be able to harvest the corners and they would be able to glean the fields. A church member that 
began and came in a, in a difficult way having two young children and she knew of a field that they would allow gleaners and so they would go she would go every day down to this field and glean as much as she could to take home to, so she could feed her family but the, under under the law there was the instruction that they were permitted to glean the field they were not to stop it and of course now you remember reading in the book of Ruth Boaz kind of took an interest in Ruth and so he instructed them to be sure that they left plenty be sure they left plenty for her God's provision okay may I step over here for just a minute and say God's provision for his people meant that they had to work okay they were not to walk up to where the, the stuff was harvested and someone would scoop in there and just hand it to them. They had to go to the field. They had to glean. They had to do for themselves as much as possible. Okay? Unlike our society today. So yes, I do believe that if someone needs uh, something that they need to work. For someone to tell me that they can't find a job, I have difficulty believing that in our current economy. Okay, because, you know, from time to time I have people call me asking for one thing or another. Where do you work? Oh, I'm not working right now. Why not? I actually had one guy tell me that there was not a job good enough for him. I said, you're not hungry enough. <laughs> That's what I told him. You're not hungry enough. Okay? But God's provision for His people was that the gleaners would be allowed to go to the field and glean, harvest. Now barley, barley was what you fed to the animals. It was the, the lower the crop. The wheat was better. Everybody likes wheat bread, don't you? I don't know of too many people that go to the store. Do you have any barley? Yeah, but barley was the, it was the grain that you fed to the animals and that was what was for the poor and it was harvested in April whereas wheat was harvested in the fall. But there was provision made. The kinsman redeemer, as I mentioned, he was the one that would take the widow and so that she would have a child in her husband's name. Leviticus chapter 25 Numbers chapter 35 is where you will find the instructions for that and that plays a pretty heavy part in the life of Ruth and Naomi may I add here I'm going to uh, sweet pea I'm going to skip down to number slide number 12 please um, I call my daughter sweet peas so just so you know who they are. <laughs> okay. Does God know what He's doing? Oh, yeah. I think He does. I think He does. Boaz's father is Salmon. See that there? And if you'll look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, you'll find that Boaz's mother was Rahab. It's called Rachab in the Greek, Rahab in the Hebrew, but that's his mother, Rahab. Where did she come from? Wasn't she, you know, James said that she was a harlot. She was a prostitute, that's what she was. And yet, she would bear a son, Boaz, who would marry a Moabitess and be the great-great-grandmother of David. So much for a pure race. Man. <laughs> so much for a pure race. People talking about being a pure race. Well, I'll tell you what. God doesn't know races. He knows people. He doesn't care the color of our skin, where we've been, where we are. He cares about where we're going. Okay? So I wanted us to be reminded that God's plan, it's just amazing. Sometimes we think, oh my goodness, what is, what is the Lord doing? Lord, would you please put up a, a postcard in the mail and tell me what's happening? Well, God's plan is never contingent upon me understanding it. Alright? Now, 
Let's go back up to slide number seven, sweetie. God's plan is an unseen plan. Back up one. An unseen plan. Israel for many years had gods, statues in Egypt. They were setting everywhere. Some estimate somewhere around 800 different kinds of gods that they had other than the big ones, you know, the god of death and the god of battle and things like that. But God's plan is not contingent upon us understanding it. Well, I know, you know, this king who decided, look what I have done. Look out here. All that I have conquered, all that I have built, aren't I special? I tell you, I'm, I'm better than permanent press shirts, I'm telling you. And look what I have accomplished. You know what happened to him? He suddenly became a beast. And for, I don't know, seven weeks, seven months, seven years, for, for some period of seven, he, he was like an animal and lived out in the field. And then when my reason returned to me, when I began to understand it's God that sets up kings and takes down kings and that's whatever whatsoever he wishes. That's true, isn't it? Okay? We are simply instruments in his hand. And it's not for us to say, Lord, you've made a mistake in doing this or doing that because God doesn't make mistakes. He had a plan. In the life of Naomi, he had a plan of what he was going to do. For we know do we really know? <laughs> for we know that all things work together for what? We need to mark that in our Bibles, don't you think? For good, not for ill, but for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. God has some good, and He's going to get some glory. Even when someone passes away, can He not receive the glory? in a life that was dedicated to Him, in a witness of faith. There's an old song. An unseen hand. How many of you remember that song? There is an unseen hand that leads me the way I cannot see. I've never seen God. I'm not in any condition to see God. But I've seen His hand work. And even among us, in times of sickness and times of difficulty, we have seen Him work and do some mighty, mighty things. He's there. Okay? I know people say 2020 has been bad. 2021 is not shaping up to be that good either. But let us not forget that there is a God in heaven. He is still on the throne. He is still God. I wonder through this sickness and through this time of uncertainty if there have been some people who come to know Christ as their personal Savior. I wonder. Because God knows what He's doing. For a long time He would give the children of Israel visual things. During the day He gave them a cloud to follow them ahead of them and they'd follow that cloud at night there would be that pillar of fire and that cloud and that pillar of fire rested over the tabernacle over the most holy place in the very center of the camp you could turn anywhere in the camp of Israel turn to the center of it and there was the pillar of fire or the cloud by day and you knew God was there okay God was there and he wasn't to be messed with. Don't you bring anything corrupt into there to sacrifice to him. Don't you mess around with him. Don't you take that ark out and take it to a battle like it's some good luck charm because you're going to pay for that. Don't put that ark of the covenant on a, on a cart and when it started wobbling, remember the man who reached up to steady it because he thought it was going to fall and he fell dead? 
Don't mess with him. Okay? He's God. He is the sovereign. He is the blessed and only potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords, is He not? He provided the children of Israel bread in the morning and man... Uh, you know that was quail, wasn't it? Anybody ever ate quail? Yep. It's supposed to be really good. No one's ever fixed that for me, by the way. Anyway, uh, God provided for them. How many days did He provide bread and meat for them? How many days? Six days. What were they supposed to do on the sixth day? Gather up enough because they were not to work on the seventh. And like God's people sometimes, they got greedy and started eating gathering on that seventh day and they started getting out and they started eating to where it was coming out their nose and ears. You know, you know when we follow God's instructions, things work out pretty good. Alright? You know, faith is unseen, isn't it? Faith is unseen. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. The trial of your faith the trial of your faith. Well, first of all, you have to have faith to try, don't you? <laughs> you have to have faith to try. Being much more precious than gold that perisheth. Wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heavy, heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, who having not seen, ye love, in whom, though ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Do we believe there's a heaven? You have to have faith to believe there's heaven. In fact, you know what? I believe there's a hell. <laughs> For those who reject Christ as their Savior, why do I believe in hell? Because God said there was. Simple enough. I tell people, you know, it's not for me to look in here and say, well, maybe that's what it says, but that's not what it means. That, that's not for me to do. I simply look at it and say, that's what it says, and that's what I need to believe. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen him, but I know he's there. In times of difficulty, I know that he's answered prayer. He's answered prayer for us a lot of times. You know what? There's been times when I wasn't real sure what was happening, but you know, God always knows what's happening. And be very honest with you, there's been times when I've had to step back and say, Lord, I'm so sorry you're working with an idiot. When I try to figure things out, when I think I've got a handle on what's happening, He shows me that I just need to step back and let Him do His job and me to stand there and say, God, I praise You for who You are. You are magnificent in glory. And when He opens doors, oh my goodness, brace yourself. When God pours out a blessing, it'll be too much almost to bear. That's the God we serve. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. The faith chapter of the Bible. Faith is the son of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In a time when 
compromise and people are uncertain which way to turn or what to do. They really need to turn to God and believe His Word is what they really need to do. It is because of faith, isn't it? It is because of faith that we believe the worlds. The Bible tells us that God spoke and it happened. We need to believe that. You know what? He, let there be light. There it was. I've said often, wouldn't it be great, ladies, you go home and say, Dinner. Better than that, clean kitchen. All right. When God spoke and it was there. And in Genesis chapter 6, when He said, I'm going to destroy this place, He destroyed it because of sin, you understand. I'm going to destroy this place, but I will protect my people. So that man and his family got inside that ark. Never got wet. I have no doubt, if I may speculate a minute, that they were scared half out of their minds when that boat started moving. But God protected them all the time and provided for them. Okay? And verse number 4 Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. How many times do we go back to Genesis chapter 4 and say, look at the sacrifices of Abel and Cain. So even now, <laughs> being dead yet speaketh. Look at verse 6. Without it, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must, that's an important word there, must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Why can an atheist be saved? It's because of what he believes. He has to change his belief, mo belief mode, doesn't he? Okay? And be honest with you, I think an atheist has more faith than many Christians do because you'd have to have more faith to believe that stuff or they don't make sense. Okay? All I've got to do is sit back and say, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> Simple. He spoke and it was there. Took him three days to make it, three days to fill it, and he crowned it with man who would oversee it because Lucifer lost his place. But Adam would forego his dominion and be subjugated under Satan. And we've been there ever since, had we? So, faith. Faith is the thing. Let's look at that chart again. Now, Salmon and Ruth, she was a Moabitess, wasn't she? Idol worshiper? At least she was. They would have Boaz. And Ruth and Boaz would have Obed. That's a good name to name your child, by the way. Obed. Who would have Jesse? Jesse would have seven children. And the youngest, which fell most of the time to the youngest, would be to watch the sheep. So David was out in the field watching sheep. But who come looking for David? Samuel. Prophet Samuel came looking for David and said, David, God has chosen you to be king. And David would be king for 44 years in the history of Israel. Ah. But we go back. We go back and we see Naomi that come home and was so bitter and just her life was so messed up. And, you know, I, 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 God has dealt me a terrible hand. And I, I, I just, it's awful. 
And yet Naomi would be the one to see Boaz and Ruth marry. She would be the one to watch Obed and Jesse as those boys grew up. Right? And she, she would get to be in the lineage of the greatest king Israel ever had. From bitterness to having nothing, she went to blessedness of being in the line not only of the king of Israel, but of also the greatest king of Israel, and that's Jesus Christ. Where did they live, by the way? They lived in Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Of the lineage of Judah. And from there, Jesus would come and He is the greatest King. And one day will reign over the, this world in peace never known before. Naomi. Oh, Naomi. You may not, she did not get to see with her physical eyes what God had planned. But we see it. Let us be reminded sometimes what's happening in Romans 8.28, we may not see it with our own physical eyes. But God's plan is at work and she would turn to blessedness and we read of her life and we say, yes, she went through a terrible, terrible valley. But look, look where it ended. As she would be in, she was part of a royal family. <laughs> and there in Bethlehem was where Jesus would be born. Wow. Don't we serve a magnificent God? provision was made. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Amos. The book of Amos. Amos chapter 4. There in the listing of what's called the minor prophets. I don't believe God had minor prophets personally. That's where they list them. But in Amos chapter 4, while Isaiah was in the city telling them and warning them of God's judgment, but also telling them that one day, <laughs> one day there would be a sacrifice made for all men, and eventually Israel would become into a blessed state. Amos is out in the country. And he tells them that I blessed you with rain and good harvest. Okay? Go down to um, starting with verse number 6. Well, he begins verse 7. And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain on one city and caused it not to rain on another. One piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water. But they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blastings and mildew when, you, when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worms devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you pestilence 
after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword and have taken away your horses and I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. I sent blessings. You wouldn't repent. I sent pestilence and all manner of, of terrible things and you would not repent. So what's left? Prepare to meet thy God. Oh, if there's a message that needs to be proclaimed through this nation, it is the message that God has blessed us with blessings upon blessings. He's caused terrible things to come about for the express purpose of helping us to see we need to turn to Him. And yet that has not happened, has it? What's left? Prepare to meet thy God. Bless your heart, the Lord's coming. He's not coming as the meek and lowly. He's not coming as a lamb, but He's coming as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, and He will come and men shall bow. Every knee shall bow. For us, as His children, it's going to be great, going to be wonderful when our faith becomes sight. But for the lost, it's going to be bad. Stand with me, please. Is that 5? In your hymn books, number 542. Mm. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear ye not the invitation, or oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning.